Hey everybody, this is Mr. Moffat coming at you with another 8 Push video. Continuing our tour of the Vietnam War through Topic 8.8. .8. Last time we were focused in on the election of 1968, and we talked about how the Democratic uh, Party, through opposition to the war and tragedy uh, and the chaotic uh, National Convention, uh, is just going to be a, pi a, a party, spiler, spi uh, party spiraling out of control. And trying to take advantage of that will be uh, former presidential candidate and Republican Richard Nixon, as we said before, trying to unite the nation under a banner of peace with honor with regards to uh, the Vietnam War. Now, Nixon in his campaign is going to be appealing to who he describes as the quote-unquote silent majority. At a time where, you know, if you watch the news, it seemed to be a nation that was on fire, a nation that was at war with itself, a nation that was, you know, rejecting its traditional cultural values, a.k.a. the hippies, uh, that there was a sense that that was what actually defined America is what you saw on the news on a nightly basis. You know, chaos, disruption, that kind of stuff. Nixon's going to argue that that is not how most Americans live and identify. He's going to argue that most Americans are still moderately conservative folks that get up and go to work every day, they go to church on Sunday, they still love America, they still wave the flag proudly, and he says that he's going to be fighting for those folks that are the majority of America, in his opinion, but may not be getting you know, the media coverage that they are necessarily due. So with that being said, Nixon's going to go on a bold campaign trying to court folks that would not historically normally vote Democrat, meaning Southerners. Southerners, and in, in, uh, for the most part, especially white male Southerners, are still going to be very upset from Lyndon Johnson and the Democratic Party's Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act, which had happened in the last few years. And so Nixon's going to try to capitalize on that white male, uh, you know, resentment. And it will prove somewhat successful. But someone trying to bank on that support even more than Nixon was Alabama Governor uh, George Wallace. Now, Wallace had become a nationally known, if not reviled, figure for his refusal to integrate uh, Alabama schools, including the University of Alabama, and the infamous speech where he would pro proclaim that, you know, Alabama was to have segregation, you know, today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And for those that were the, you know, the most bitter about integration, the most resentful about integration, and not just that, but, you know, the expanded liberal values of the counterculture and the expanded uh, social programs under the, uh, under the Great Society, Wallace seemed to be attracting those folks. Now, Wallace is never really going to be somebody that will have much of a chance to win on a national basis. But as you study histor uh, if you study pre presidential elections, you'll notice that third-party independent candidates, which Wallace was, he's going to run as an independent, uh, can have an impact on the overall results. And this will prove to be true as well in 1968. Uh, now, that being said, Hubert Humphrey, who had been the Democrat nominee in 1968, uh, will start off with a you know very, very big deficit up against Nixon. But over the course of the next couple months, Humphrey will begin to close the gap, uh, especially with a few weeks left in the campaign that Humphrey would... Uh, pledge to begin to pull troops out of Vietnam. In other words, basically making a tacit promise to end the war, which is something that young Democrats have been wanting forever. But unfortunately for Humphrey and anti-war activists, this is going to be a little too late uh, for Humphrey to be able to pull out the election. And when we see the results come in in 1968, though it will be a pretty darn close election in terms of the popular vote, Nixon's going to come out by a pretty decent margin in the Electoral College. Note some of the inroads that Nixon's going to be able to make in Tennessee and the Carolinas and Florida uh, to win over folks that had some bitterness over you know, the Civil Rights Movement. But also note that Wallace is going to win the most hardcore of Southern segregation votes in the Deep South, stretching from Arkansas out to Georgia. 
And that is going to be almost completely taking away from what had been traditionally Democrat votes. So with, you know, Humphrey not being able to appeal to the anti-war vote for much of the campaign because of Nixon's heavy campaigning in the South, the emergence of the Wallace campaign, uh, we're going to be seeing Richard Nixon uh, becoming the next president of the United States, which then means where do we go from here? Nixon will be inheriting a, a unbelievably divided nation, a nation that's trying to figure out its values, and most importantly, what are we going to do in Vietnam? Well, let's take a look. Uh, for Nixon, once he becomes president, he's going to start to define what peace with honor means. And for him, it's going to mean Vietnamization. So what is Vietnamization? Vietnamization is the idea of taking this conflict in Vietnam and try to revert it to back to kind of where it started initially before the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. The idea being is that initially this was a South Vietnamese war that the U.S. was assisting with. But following the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, it had clearly become an American war with the South Vietnamese assisting us. So Nixon wants to basically put more of the responsibility in the South Vietnamese to defend themselves and reduce America's role in South Vietnam. And this is going to be manifested with a slow, steady decline in U.S. troop levels. Uh, but note, even though we're kind of going in a direction to slowly reduce our influence and our impact in Vietnam, it's still going to be very slow. Uh, it's still going to be four more long years of American troops still being drafted and still being sent to Vietnam with more American soldiers uh, being killed. So understand that, yeah, you know, if you were against the war, maybe we're moving in the right direction, but it's going to be way too slow for, you know, for what you were wanting to achieve. Now, keep in mind that another key part of the Nixon program, though this is going to be kept under wraps and more secretive, is the desire to try to shut down what had been a major thorn in American uh, servicemen's fight against the communists. And that was the infamous Ho Chi Minh Trail. If you forgot, that was that secret supply route that allowed the NVA to send supplies into South Vietnam to aid the Viet Cong by going through neighboring countries, Laos and Cambodia. Johnson had uh, refused to allow American servicemen to go into Laos and Cambodia out of fear of expanding the war. Nixon's not going to have, have those same qualms, though he's going to be doing this secretly because he knows that the war is so unpopular now that anything that might look like it would be expanding the war would not go over very well. But nonetheless, we're going to start to see in late 69, early 1970, America beginning to secretly invade Cambodia. But of course, how long can you keep an invasion of a foreign country secret? Uh, it starts to become widely known that the U.S. was now fighting in Cambodia, which meant that this despised and hated war was now expanding. And what had been basically a fire of anti-war sentiment across America's college campuses is now going to be doused with gasoline. You are going to be seeing the biggest anti-war demonstrations of the war yet. And unfortunately, it's going to turn violent, most infamously at Kent State University outside of Akron. We are going to be seeing American, excuse me, we're going to be seeing Ohio National Guardsmen attempting to try to uh, stifle an anti-war protest that had gotten violent the previous night. Previous night, uh, anti-war activists had, uh, you know, tried to burn down the ROTC building, a common thing that you saw in a lot of these college campuses was not just an anti-war sentiment, but an anti-military sentiment, which I'll explain a little bit more as to kind of why that was becoming more popular. But nonetheless, due to the incidents happening the previous night, Governor Rhodes is going to be sending the Ohio National Guard to maintain the peace and law and order on the campus. But when these soldiers show up the next day, you're going to see the anti-war activists respond in kind. You're going to see rocks and bottles and sticks and whatnot thrown at the soldiers. Uh, and unfortunately, almost reminiscent of the Boston Massacre, you're going to be seeing uh, the Ohio National Guard, out of a sense of fear, uh, fire on the students, fire on the anti-war demonstrators, killing four, some of whom were killed not even as part of the protest, 
just simply walking to their next class. The war that had been killing tens of thousands of American soldiers in Vietnam was now killing unarmed college students here at home. On top of that, we will see at, uh, uh, at Jackson State University in Mississippi, we will see a, another somewhat similar incident that will kill two more students. So this war is crippling America. It is absolutely ripping us apart. And what is going to be adding to this, you know, sense of hatred of the war and hatred of the military amongst young people will, will be an incident that had taken place in 1968, but had been effectively or almost effectively covered up by the U.S. military uh, for almost two years. And this will be the infamous My Lai Massacre. Uh, the My Lai Massacre is going to be taking place when soldiers in Charlie Company, under the leadership of Lieutenant William Calley, they're pictured on the left, uh, will attempt to try to root out a VC base. Now, Charlie Company had taken a lot of fire and a lot of casualties in recent weeks. So this is a group of soldiers that were mad, angry, and looking for revenge, if not their pound of flesh. And they're going to do that at My Lai. Uh, when they get to My Lai, they're going to realize that there really aren't any likely VC there. It's pretty much just old men, women, and children. But as I said, these guys had come for revenge. They had come for their pound of flesh. They were very paranoid, and they basically were going to inflict their vengeance upon them by lining this village, this, the, these villagers up and just executing them in mass. Uh, we will see hundreds of innocent civilians massacred at this, in, at this incident. And it almost was swept under the rug. It almost never would have gone public if it weren't for a couple of uh, uh, helicopter pilots flying by over the scene and realized what had been happening. Uh, now, these pilots had, you know, followed the chain of command to report had, what had happened. And, you know, the military brass did try their best to try to make sure this never really saw the light of day. But when it did get leaked out, this is going to have another devastating effect on America's support of the war. Uh, this is going to lead to, you know, the war not just being hated and despised, but the soldiers themselves in many cases being hated and despised by fellow Americans back home. This is where some of the chance of baby killers is going to be starting to emerge. And this horrific singular incident is going to stain the reputation of servicemen, across the board that served in Vietnam. So understand between Mi Lai becoming public, the invasion of Cambodia, the Kent State shootings, uh, the war is becoming even more of a mess and we haven't even seen the last of it yet. When we come back next time, we're going to bring the Vietnam War to a conclusion, a tragic conclusion, and we'll talk about the legacy and the lessons learned from this failed uh from this failed war we'll see you next time bye bye